morning. Today we are kicking off, launching this brand new summer series called Follow Me. And I want to let you know something else that we're kicking off today with this series. We are kicking off a epic, an epic community-wide reading plan for the summer. We're going to spend the rest of the summer looking at really Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's where we get so much about uh, the life of Jesus from. And what we also want to do is, is read as a church-wide community, read through the Gospels this summer. So whether you're a religious person, whether you've memorized the entire Bible or anywhere in between, we, we think this would be great for just our church community to do this. There are 89 chapters between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we're looking about three months of a commitment of reading that. And we want to really put that's on the bottom shelf for you, okay? We want to help you. We want to remind you, but we're going uh, beyond that. Lindsay and perhaps her crew, at least Lindsay's overseeing this. If you would just take out your communication card and somewhere on there, there's a line for things you can sign up for. Just write the word plan. And here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll do the hard part. Um, by we, I mean the team that I lead. You know, it's like, uh, it's like when someone tells me, Ben, thanks so much for the gift you and Shauna gave us. I'm like, awesome. You're welcome. What is it? Um, so our team is going to make sure that you get this. But if you write the word plan, here's what's going to happen. Um, give us your email address, even if we have it already. If you're a husband, wife, or you're here with a roommate, whatever, you're just, however, whoever you're filling the card out for, give us all of those email addresses. And what will happen is you will receive, yes, a reminder every day for the next 89 days of the text that we're reading. But we're, you know, that, that's the average church. We're going, Lindsay's crew is taking it up a notch. We're going to email you the text every day. Okay? I know, like, really bottom shelf here. Like, I should probably make you more mature than you are. But, um, we, so every single day starting tom like tomorrow, you will be emailed the entire scripture, Matthew chapter 1. Okay? So from your phone, iPad, computer, we just believe that if we're going to be looking at the life of Jesus and, and what it means to follow him on Sundays, a great uh, complimentary thing to do in, uh, corresponding with that is just to get into the four Gospels throughout um, this summer in our daily reading time. This, I mean, most of this will take you five minutes or less. You can read more. You can get in-depth commentary online, different places. But just as a community, just we're going to have it emailed to us. We can read it, and we're all sort of tracking together. So whether you're on a, a business trip in Shanghai, whether you are uh, on vacation in Hawaii, whatever the case, just talking about a couple places I'd be jealous of, um, uh, wherever you are this summer, you, can, you, you will be able, as long as you have internet, you'll be able to get, uh, you'll be able to get uh, the text that we're all looking at today. And I think it's just neat to kind of bring some synergy to us while it's a summertime, we're all in and out and just kind of goes, okay, we're all looking at this together and uh, uh, share with friends what you learned that day. If you know that people are going to do this plan with you, welcome email ha ha will come out tonight, I think, before you go to bed. And then uh, chapter one of Matthew you and then on and on and on starting tomorrow. Same thing. Great idea. Not my idea, but a great idea. Um, so follow me. These are the words that Jesus uses to invite his first ever disciples into life with himself, into the adventure that we're going to be looking at over the summer. Um, if all of us in this room were handed a questionnaire and one of the sections was religious affiliation, many of us might say, not all of us, which is cool, many of us might say that we are Christians or if there was another phrase there, followers of Jesus, we would declare that indeed that's how we affiliate ourselves religiously, and I think that's wonderful. And um, at the same time, you're like, Ben, okay, we already are this, many of us at least. Why are we doing a whole summer series on following Jesus? Here's why. When I look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I look at the life that Jesus lived in close proximity on a daily basis with his original 12 disciples over three years, like every single day practically, and yet at the end of those three years, they really didn't have a clue what was going on with Jesus. So I think it would be crazy for us and foolish for us to assume that we know everything that it entails when it comes to following Jesus. And so I'm praying that this adventure will awaken something, something within us. And I don't care if you've been going to church since you were in your mother's womb and you're up there in years. I don't care if you've memorized the Bible or if you're the pastor of this church. I think there's always something fresh for us to learn. And so um, wherever you're at, 
wherever you are on that journey, let's just engage and see what we can learn from Jesus as we think about, hopefully, or want to continue on being his followers. I think that's a big thing. And then what does it mean to follow him in San Francisco and to follow him in my relationships and to follow him with my job and to follow him in the way I decide to use my money, on and on and on. We think that following Jesus has implications. So we, we want to look at that this summer. Today um, is a message that is, I would love to say has, but it is one that is revolutionizing my own heart. What the big idea of today is, is something that uh, is very personal for me right now, and it's not because you're going to hear many personal stories. It's just the weight of this message. I really believe God has just invaded my heart over the last couple of years, and even specifically over the last couple of months. It seems like every book that I'm reading through, it speaks to this. Everything that I'm talking with our staff team about, everything I'm trying to do as a parent and a husband flows out of this. And so what I want to do um, is just let you know, for the rest of the series, we're going to talk a lot about what do we do as followers of Jesus? How do we follow? What do we actively participate and engage in? But today is about what precedes all of that. Today is about one of these things that if we don't get today right, then what I think will happen is following Jesus will become this weight that we can't bear. If we don't understand today, by the way, artist circle seats are still all available up here at the front. So just like, I'm not too much of a spitter, but uh, we got lots of great seats right, right here. Um, so today's message really is, um, it's a primary thing for me because I think the rest of it won't make sense in the right way if we don't understand the centrality of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I really believe in it that much because of what it's doing in my own life, in my own heart. Um, and and the, what I want to say to you is that today's idea is something that we need to get to know. It is something we need to embrace, and it's something we need to remind ourselves of on a frequent basis. And the reason I want to start here before we get into all the doing of following Jesus is because I believe there's a defining moment in the earthly life of Jesus that has nothing yet to do with what he does and what he accomplishments, accomplishes in regarding his purpose and his mission. And so I want us to begin in this defining moment. If you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 3. If you need one, just lift a hand and we will get one place to all of you and these are yours to keep. If you need a Bible, just uh, raise a hand. We're on page 524 in the Bibles that we're passing out right now. Matthew chapter 3, we'll start in verse 16. We'll read through chapter 4, verse 11. And I hope, um, I hope that some things that have started to become unlocked in my own heart and understanding will, will be true for you uh, this morning. And I think today's idea is just something we need to remind ourselves of, but for some of us, it will be a first time kind of thing today, even if we've been following Jesus a really long time. At least it was for me. Let's stand and read this together. Matthew 3, we'll start in verse 16. We'll read through chapter 4, verse 11. Here's this defining moment. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God... Command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone." Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. You may have a seat. So before Jesus begins his public ministry, 
Before Jesus calls his first disciples, before Jesus performs his first miracle, before you hear Jesus given, giving his first masterful teaching, which we'll get to in the coming weeks, before you see Jesus dying for the sins of the world on the cross, before you see Jesus defying death and experiencing the resurrection, you see this profound, amazing, defining moment. If you were to read the verses preceding where we began in verse 16, you would see that Jesus essentially says to John the Baptist, I want you to baptize me. Me, to which John the Baptist is like, me, baptize you? I mean, can you imagine like Jesus being in your church and you're teaching to him every week? Or like, yeah, I'm going to baptize you. Um, John the Baptist is like, no, I'm not going to do that. Jesus is like, uh, yes, you are. <laughs> um, and so he does. So he puts him under the water. He comes up out of the water and it says that the heavens open up, the spirit of God rests on him. And there is what I think is this powerful yet tender voice speaking from the heavens saying, this is my beloved son. With him, I am well pleased. This is my beloved son. With him, I am well pleased. And I believe this defining moment de determines everything else that happens in the earthly ministry and life and death and even resurrection of Jesus. This defining moment of this is my son. He's the one that I love deeply and I am well pleased. I'm well pleased with him. Well, the question has to be, what is he pleased with? Is he pleased that Jesus has started to heal people? Is he pleased because Jesus is telling all of the humans in Jerusalem about what God wants them to know? Is he pleased because he's starting to see life transformation in these 12 guys that he invites to be his disciples? Absolutely not. How do you know? Because he hasn't done anything yet. At this point, Jesus hasn't accomplished an ounce of his mission at this point, Jesus hasn't begun his public ministry. He hasn't done any miracles. He's not given the Sermon on the Mount. He's not even invited the disciples to follow him at this particular point. We've got lots of chairs elsewhere. You guys, if you guys can help them get some chairs, then that would be awesome. And again, I would say we're going to remove the front row, but I know how that would work. Come on up. Come on up. So, uh, just to catch you guys up that are walking in, um, we just started this great message on how God loves it when we are on time. No, I'm kidding. I am, I am just joking. You guys, come on up. We're glad you guys are here. Where are you from? Where are you guys from? Awesome. Mississippi. Perfect. You guys, great. We're glad that you're here. Come on in. Come on in. Awesome. All right, like I was saying, everybody keep coming on in. We'll just... Uh, I've got, all, I've, got a, I've got a seat up here. <laughs> Just to catch you guys up, our text for today is Matthew 3, 16. Uh, we, we, we read through 4, 11, and we're just getting going. So you have this profound... You have this profound moment. And what I want to say is that I believe this defines the rest of the earthly ministry that Jesus does. And so you have this moment where the heavens open up, God's Spirit somehow rests on Jesus, and he hears this voice from the Father... This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I am so pleased. And he hasn't done anything to accomplish mission yet. And the reason I want us to begin here is because if we don't get first things first, if we don't understand what's primary, then you will do what I have done for much of my Christian life, and that is to try to build or earn an, uh, an, an, an identity for myself. I will try to do things for God. I will try to make sure that I do enough so that the statement we just said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased, so that it will be true over my life. I will try to earn it rather than realize what God is doing for Jesus is the same thing he wants to do for us. He doesn't want us to seek to earn it. He wants us just to receive it from him as our reality. And if we don't live out of this reality, then what you will find over the next 13 or so weeks when we look at the gospels is it's impossible to do the kinds of things Jesus wants us to do if we're trying to do them for an identity rather than from an identity. And this is really revolutionizing my own heart. It's the message I'm trying to get into my own kids because it's not one that's set in the center of my own heart growing up. It's one I want them to see. Like, listen, guys, I want you to be awesome. Uh, little dad brag time. My 10-year-old just got named the San Francisco All-Star Team, all right? So um, stud, uh, you can guess which chromosomes those are working. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I'm just telling him, like yesterday, he's just thrilled. They got the jersey, he's like buttoned down, cream color, San Francisco in red. He's number nine, and he's practicing with these all-stars, and they're letting him pitch. I'm just like, all right, man, just remember, 
Just remember, it's about who you are, not what you do. <laughs> it's who you are. Because this message is so revolutionary, and it's not just revolutionary for the good things that happen in our lives that we want to attach our identity to. For so many of us in this room, we have negative things from our past, maybe our very recent past, and those things get attached to and become our identity as well. And so we really want to be careful with that. And so um, what Jesus hears really are the words that all of us have longed to hear our entire lives, right? That someone who actually matters is well pleased with us. It, it is one thing to be loved by someone that knows us in part. That's a, that's a pretty good thing if, if you like them, okay? It is one thing to be loved by someone who knows us in part. It is quite a different thing to be loved by someone who knows us fully. Wouldn't you agree? And so some of you guys in this room, you're, you're feeling all like confident because um, the first date went well. Uh, just so you know, she's going to get to know the real you, okay? She's going to know you don't always dress like that, right? She's going to know you don't always have your car clean. I mean, she's going to know these things, and then will she love you anyway? I remember when I first started dating Shauna a number of years ago, and uh, we were at her parents for the very first time for me to be with her parents. She had been there before. Um, but for the first time that I was in the home of her parents, I'd been there about two days, and her mom, who is just, um, mm, I just think so much of this woman, she said to me, Ben, I'm sure you're not perfect, but I haven't seen it yet. Just wait, girl, you know? <laughs> so she barely knew me, and she did think that. 14 years later, she, she wouldn't say that today if she was up here. She's seen things that I struggle with. She's seen the real me, but what's awesome is that she loves me in a deeper way now than she did then. And some of us don't believe that God's voice to Jesus can be his voice to us because we know the movie clips from our own lives, don't we? We know the dark days. We know the hopeless days. We know the days and sometimes seasons and years and perhaps some of us decades that we rejected God and went our own way. And so could what he's saying to Jesus, can he say this to us? Because can we be honest? It's not that far-fetched that God would love his perfect son in this amazingly well-pleased way. But can he love me, his imperfect son, or you, his imperfect daughter, in this same way? And can he make this statement over our lives? This is my son. This is my daughter with whom I am well-pleased. Because can we be honest? Every one of us in this room have done things in our lives, most of us this week, and a great majority of us over the last 24 hours that we know in and of themselves couldn't have been pleasing to God right? So can he say this? And if he can say this over our lives, how can he say this over our lives? And Ben, why are we getting so into this identity thing? Here's why, because if we don't get this identity piece, the rest of it would just be a weight that you can't bear. I can't bear. And some of you, what you need to experience and what you came here for this morning is to find freedom from having to earn and build and create and make your own identity. That's what he's wanting to give to you this morning, to speak this over us. Well, if Jesus, or if God can speak this over our lives, how can he do so? Um, what the scriptures are really clear on is they talk about this great exchange that takes place. This is what our entire faith is built on. And so let's make sure we're not confused or assuming the wrong things here. Our entire faith is built on this great exchange. And the scriptures speak of it all over the place. But my favorite place that really clarifies it is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where Paul says to the church at Corinth, that God made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, who was the perfect one, who was the righteous one. He was sinless. God made him who knew no sin to become sin, to own our sin, to take our sin upon him on the cross so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the only way we enter a relationship with God the Father through Jesus. And this is also the only way we can have these words be true over our lives, but they are true. You're like, but Ben, does he say it over me or does he say it to the Jesus in me? Uh, the whole point of identity is that it's one and the same. With me? The, the whole point behind this big identity message from the Gospels is that there, there's no distinction. We, have made, we either have it, received this or we, we have, or we have rejected the exchange that Jesus came to make in our hearts on our behalf. So he takes our sin, that's the exchange he gets. We get the better end of the deal just so we're all clear. He gets our sin, we, we get his righteousness, so that the voice reigning over our lives is this, this is my beloved daughter, this is my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased with. What you've been longing to hear your entire life is available to you this morning. It is not automatic in the sense that every one of us in this room are children of God. That's not the kind of father we're talking about here. We're talking about those of us who have received the identity he's given us through Jesus Christ. And if you've not made that decision, I want to encourage you to like, at least consider and contemplate and reflect on what we're talking about this morning. I, I think it, it is a life-altering and really an eternity-altering message that we can receive and embrace and lean into 
this morning. And so, um, here, here, but here's what we need to know. The, the greatest threat to you and I following Jesus, I think, is twofold. One is forgetting who we are. Two is forgetting who God is. Okay, and it may sound elementary, but there, there's so many um, deep uh, implications of this. And, and so I'm trying to say to my boys at home, like, guys, this really is most important. Knowing who you are in God and knowing who God is, if you forget these, the wills come off. If you forget these, the wills come off. And so we don't need to just know and embrace. We need to remind ourselves daily of this reality. Because what we know is that Satan's tactics from the very beginning of creation have been to cause humanity to forget who we are and who the God is that made us. You remember Adam and Eve? You've heard of them? Garden of Eden, they have unhindered fellowship with God. They are deeply satisfied. They are deeply filled with joy. They are knowing God and there's nothing ever separating them from God. And they think they have and, and they do have the best life possible. But then Satan comes to them and he tries to get them to forget who they are and forget who God is. He says, if you will eat from this tree that God told you not to, you won't just be the beloved son or the beloved daughter of God. You'll actually be like him. And so they reject their identity in that moment. They reject who God is, wanting his throne in their own lives. And ever since the beginning of time, that's how we've been thrown off. That's how you're thrown off today. If you're living out of a false identity, that's how. You've forgotten who you are or you've forgotten who God is. When I get thrown off, I'm like, oh, my first identity as a pastor, I've got to be the... No, that's not my primary identity. Your primary identity isn't husband, it isn't wife, it isn't grandfather, it isn't college student, it isn't tech guy or girl. It is that you can be the beloved son or the beloved daughter of God. If you look at the first temptation that Satan gives to Jesus, this is where it starts. He goes after his identity. He goes after his identity, Matthew 4, 3. Satan came to Jesus and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, okay? I know some of us in this room, fellas, like four hours, we're thinking of double cheeseburgers. 40 days, 40 nights. And so Satan goes after him where he's, humanly speaking, the weakest, as any of us would be. And he says, if you're really the son of God, he's like, prove yourself. Now, Satan knew what Jesus knew and what we know now from reading the Gospels. Jesus had no tr trouble ever making a lot of food with something else, did he? If you keep reading, if you get, like, those of you that are writing plan on your communication card, we're going to email you a couple of stories where Jesus feeds multiple, multiple thousands of people. The first miracle you're going to encounter is Jesus taking ordinary wine, water and making extraordinary wine out of it. Not two buck chuck, Okay. Check it out. It's in the scriptures. So he doesn't have a problem using something to make food. But he's unwilling to take the bait. And I think in this moment, it's just maybe six or so weeks from when he's heard this from the Father. I think he closes his eyes, he focuses, and he remembers the voice of God speaking to him. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You don't have to prove yourself. And the world Jesus lived in is not so unlike the world you and I live in that constantly challenges us. People, bosses, parents, coaches, pastors, you've got to do this so that you become that. And so we're all setting out every day. It'll start again in the morning. You're going to set out to prove yourself, to show them you have what it takes. You can do it. And we take the same thing when it comes to our spiritual lives. God, I can do it. God, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I will read some more. I will church, go to church some more. I will show up in my small girl. I'll start serving great things. But when we do them to get an identity rather than uh, do those things flowing out of an identity, things get backwards. And so what Satan is saying to him, and Jesus just quotes Deuteronomy 8.3, he's like, listen, no, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And you know what word I think Jesus is remembering in this moment from the voice of God? You're my beloved son. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to become it. Not you might be, not you will be when you get the mission, not when you get to the resurrection. No, you are. You are. Some of us in this room who would say, yes, we're followers of Jesus, we're not living out of that identity. You're trying to earn it still and remember, remind yourself, receive it. Live from it, not for it. Live from it, not for it. And I just want to ask us this morning, like what, what's the loudest and clearest voice in your life when it comes to your identity? What's the loudest and clearest voice in your life when it comes to your identity? Is it the voice of your boss? Is it the voice of your critics? You're like, Ben, those are one and the same. For many of us, here's what it is. Is it the voice of your past? 
Like you want to move on, but oh, you're, you're just assuming that you're still that same person. You've done things that brought shame. You've done things that brought guilt. And so what Satan wants to tempt you to think is, no, you can't be who Jesus says you are. You've got to be what you did. You are what you did. You are what you lack. Because another one of his tactics is to make us convinced that we don't have enough, that we aren't enough, that we're not a good enough Christian, not a good enough parent, not a good enough employee, whatever. What's the loudest voice? Is it the voice of the Father in your life? So he goes after his identity, and then the second temptation in verse 5, he does something similar. He says to him, takes him up to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he says, verse 6, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. That doesn't sound too smart. But if you're the Son of God. Now, I've seen people throw themselves from places and they thought nothing would happen to them, right? Either a deranged adult or a four-year-old who's never had the experience. You've seen this? Like the tallest piece of furniture, they've watched way too many movies, and they're like, okay, I'm going to jump from this, like, you know, dresser, and I'm going to be fine. And so Satan says to him, to Jesus, if you're the son of God, why don't you just jump off? I mean, right? Can't you, like, break your fall? Like, why don't you, you know, why don't you just jump off? But here's what he does. Something looks subtle if you don't look into it. Because Jesus responds in temptation one with the word of God, guess what Satan does in temptation two? He uses God's voice, he uses God's word, but he distorts it. He, Satan, this should scare us a little bit, he quotes Psalm 91, 11, and 12. The devil does. I don't know if it feels weird that he knows more about God's word than we do, I'm just saying. Look what he says. He says, For it is written, verse 6, that God will command his angels concerning you, Jesus. On their hands they are going to bear you up, and you won't strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus responds again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He does this out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. So first temptation, if you are the son of God, prove yourself. Second temptation, again, if you are the son of God, prove yourself because God's word says you can jump and you'll be fine. And Jesus is like, oh no, we don't put God to the test. He gives them the word of God again. Temptation three is one that every one of us in this room have succumbed to at some point in our lives. Some of you are doing so right now in this moment of your, of your life. Temptation three he shows him the kingdoms of this world, and he says this to him. If you will just worship me, no big deal, just worship me, you can have all this. He, he asks Jesus, he tempts Jesus to forsake the first commandment, which says what? You shall have no other, yeah, no other gods before me. It is important that you and I don't forget who we are. We've been talking about that. It is equally important that we don't forget who God is. And what I've been saying to you and what I want to say to my own kids, and I've been say, t- saying even to our staff, like, guys, this sounds elementary, but there are deep implications. We cannot forget who we are, and we cannot forget who God is. If you forget who you really are, then what you will do is run after everything else in this world to gain an identity, to gain some sense of approval, to get a reputation, to become known so that you can be um, a person who's earned the love of God or the love of whoever you're seeking to earn. But if you forget who God is, then what you'll do with everything else in life is you'll make one of those things the ultimate thing in your life. And you and I will begin to worship people and things and accomplishments and whatever it is that we decide to value most, whatever it is we ultimately put our hope in, whatever it is that we ultimately set on the thrones of our lives. Jesus didn't forget who he was and he didn't forget who God was. And I believe it is in this remembering that allows his earthly life to be fulfilled or to fulfill his mission in the way that he does so moving forward. You know, this phrase, Jesus, if you are the son of God, this wasn't the last time he heard it. In fact, I think the greatest temptation moment Jesus ever had wasn't here in the wilderness. I think it had to be when he was on the cross. And in Matthew 27, 40, here's what it says about it. His mockers and his his eventual murderers, they said about him or to him, if you are the son of God, Remove yourself from the cross. Now, I know what happens when anyone dares us, right? Like, okay. Like, yeah, I'm approaching 40, but if you want to race me, little kid, come on. <laughs> Delusional. But they say to Jesus in that great moment of excruciating pain, if you're the son of God, show us. If you're the son of God, prove yourself. Jesus does, and I think he rests. I think he closes his eyes and focuses one more time, and he remembers the voice of the Father. You are my beloved son. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to earn this. This is who you are. 
and he dies. And 14 verses later in verse 54, the centurion, the guard there, and some others, you know what they said? Truly, he was the son of God. What's the defining voice over your life and identity right now? What are you living out of? What is truest about you in this moment? If we don't remind ourselves of who we actually are and who God actually is, then we will be on this never-ending quest to find something that will ultimately fulfill us. And let me just let you know, because this has happened to billions of other people, if that's the quest you're on, you will die on that quest. You, you will die on that quest. Whatever the achievements are, whatever the salary is, whatever the patents are that are attached to your name, whatever degrees you end up with, you will die on that quest if that's what you're looking for. Wasn't it Augustine who said in his classic work, Confessions, that our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you? And so in this moment of Jesus' baptism, he's not earning an identity. It's not like God the Father's going, you finally went under the water. But his baptism, it's a moment where he's declaring the identity that the Father has bestowed upon him. Some of you, maybe baptism is the next step. July 13th, five weeks from today, is our next opportunity for baptism. It's not to get you or to create you in you an identity. It is just to declare to our community and to the world, this is what's true about me. This is what's most true about me. I'd love to pray for you guys, if you don't mind bowing your heads, closing your eyes. I would love to say this is a message I have learned. Instead, I am delighted to say this is a message I am learning. That we don't have to perform for God. We don't have to live for his, like to earn his approval. That in Christ, he's given that to us. In Christ, he's given us this great exchange. And of course, what I know to be true in this room, some of you have, have, have not received it yet, which means that you've rejected that. And I just want to encourage you would you allow this to be what's truest about you? That the God who made the world, the God who knit you together, the scriptures say in your mother's womb, who loves you, who, who carved up this rescue plan to come and rescue you from yourself and from your sin, and, and, and he allows the sinless life of Jesus, that righteousness, to be deposited into your account. And you've been invited to enter into this relationship with God as your father, I want to encourage you to think about receiving that. And for those of us in this room who we, we know, like there's this marker in, in our life. We, we have we've given our life to Jesus as best we know how, but yet many of us are operating out of uh, the reality that we have to go earn this identity or that we have to work for it, and we're carrying this spiritual weight and pressure. And what I want you to hear today, and though it's my voice, I want you to hear it as the voice of your Father in heaven saying this, this is my beloved daughter, with you I am well pleased. This is my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. And guys, I know it almost sounds too good to be true. But that's no reason to reject it. Rest in this. Work from this, not for this. Follow Jesus from this reality, not to get it. And you can mark on your card whether you want to talk to one of us about baptism or you want to receive this identity from Jesus. Um, this is what the centrality of our message is. That God sent Jesus to take on our sin, allowing us to take on his righteousness. And whatever you may accomplish, however you would become known, it won't touch this. Jesus said, come to me and find life abundant. He said, um, it'll be like uh, this never-ending um, water of life poured out into your heart. God, I pray that you would work the things in our hearts that only you can. God, when we're tempted, as we will be, if Adam and Eve were and Jesus was, of course, he'll come for us. God, help us be rooted in who we are in you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing this song of response.